Welcome, and thank you for listening to Sandy Creek Stirrings. I'm your host, Joshua Jimenez. And if you're going to win souls, you've got to love souls. In spite of their meanness, in spite of the way they look, in spite of everything, you've got to seek to bring souls to Jesus Christ because you love them, because Jesus loved them, and because Jesus died for them, and you're trying to bring them to the Son of God. The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, my last verse, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I've based my whole life on that, that it pays to serve God, and I believe that with all my heart. God has given us a guidebook. God has given us a directional map, and that guidebook, that map, is the precious Word of God. Listen, don't just go and sit in the pew. Find some way to serve and serve as a family. Be a part of everything at church, and when you learn to love what God loves, um, your children will learn to love it as well. Homes are not that spiritually strong. We're getting overtaken by the world quickly, but unfortunately, we're pumping all the sewage in. You know, we're letting the world in when that ought to be a haven. Where is my church going? Ten signs your church is changing is the episode topic for today. This has been a 10-part series we've been going over. It's been scattered about throughout many different episodes. Our last episode today is episode number 208. Our last episode we actually discussed this topic was all the way back 10 episodes ago, episode one, um, episode number 198 which is where my church was going, part seven. And uh, there's actually 10 different parts, but one of those episodes is a two-part episode. We cover two different things. But we've been talking about this series for quite some time now, something that's been on my heart. And, you know, it's important that we note the changes taking place in churches and take a look at where things are headed in the future. By the way, that is a biblical principle. If anybody has a problem and says, well, you know, I don't think you should examine your church, you're dead wrong. Proverbs 22, verse 3 says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. And sadly, I have heard too many stories of listeners, people in my church, who have watched as they sat in churches that used to be good, that used to be on fire for God, And they sat in those churches, and things began to change. Things began to go different. The situation was no longer the same. And really, the sad part of this whole series is how often and how many churches do change. I think if you're being an honest listener, you could probably tell me a church you know of that used to be good, that used to be on fire for God, that used to be, used to be, used to be, but it's not anymore. I mean, we could go back to some of the great churches of old who were led by phenomenal men of God. Um, one that jumps to my, my mind right away is uh, Dr. Lee Robertson, one of my favorites, as part of the intro to this podcast. And that very first, uh, the very first voice you hear after mine in the intro to this podcast is Dr. Lee Robertson. I've read his books listen to his preaching. I've studied his his life and th- different things about him. I appreciate his stand for God. And he pastored a wonderful church that did so many great things for God at the Highland Park Baptist Church. And But sadly, that church is non-existent as it used to be anymore. It's just not. Churches do change if we're not careful. Churches do make changes. And if you're being honest, I think, especially if you're on staff at a church— You understand the people who have been hurt by churches that have changed and gone a different direction. And many times, if we're not careful, if we don't remove ourselves from that situation before it's too late, well then, friend, we could put our family up in jeopardy, the the literal spiritual health of our of our family, our kids and our wives and our marriages could literally be up for grabs if we're not careful and don't foresee the evil and hide ourselves from it. I think back to a little uh, a time when I was a a kid, and we were at a church, and my parents could foresee the evil that was coming. And at that time, we moved and we relocated, and God really did a work. That church went on to go through a 
a huge church split. I mean, terrible things happened. Thankfully, that church recovered. They got a new pastor. Things were going well. And um, But w- thankfully, my parents foresaw the evil that was coming and hit ourselves. And parents have to be careful of that, especially when you're sitting in that type of situation. And so where is my church going? Ten signs your church is changing is really just covering some what I believe are signs that your church may be changing. Your church may be going a different direction than the standards and the different things that they stood for for so long have begun to fade away. And uh, these are small changes. I don't know if I'd call them small. Uh, I just did, but I don't know if I personally would refer to them as being small. I think they're a big issue. Some of you might think they're small. I think they're big. And if you don't believe me, go back and listen to some of these episodes. Let me give you a list of what we've talked about real quick, and then we'll move forward. Episode number 166 was the very first episode in the series, and we talked about dimming the lights. Um, I believe dimming the lights in the church going to a darker atmosphere within the church, within the, even just the lighting, um, I think is a change, and I think it's a pointer. It's pointing, all right, here is the direction we are going. And uh, that was episode number 166. You don't believe me? Go back and listen to the episode. If you still don't believe me, then send me an email, joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. Uh, episode number 168, we talked about a focus on emotionalism. A focus on emotionalism, where we have a song service that's an hour and a half long and we preach for 20 minutes, um, I think can sometimes turn, if that's the standard, it can become a focus on emotionalism. We talked about in episode number 173, the casualing of the dress standards by the leadership. Casualing of dress standards by the leadership. Your pastor used to wear a suit and tie, and now he only wears a polo shirt and a hoodie. Uh, I think that's a big pointer to where your church is going, if you haven't figured it out already. And of course, each of these episodes, as I give you, if you want to go back and listen to them and get caught up to date, that'd be a great idea. We talked about episode number 174, the introduction of the contemporary Christian movement or music within the church. Introduction of CCM, that was episode number 174. Uh, After you listen to that series, I really encourage you. We've got a three-part series entitled The Truth About Music. The Truth About Music Part 3, I don't have the episode number written down, but you can go through the list of over 200 episodes we have and find The Truth About Music Part 3. We discussed how CCM, the Contemporary Christian Movement, which produced Christian contemporary music, uh, how it came into existence. And so we talked about that. Uh, Number whatever number this is, episode number 179, we talked about when a church just brings in the new. And you say, what's that? Go back and listen to the episode 179. Episode number 184, we did a two-part. Uh, there was two different things we covered in that. One was a church's stand on the Word of God, the King James Bible, and then two, their unification with false churches. And then last but not least, our most recent episode was episode number 198, Politics Overtake the Pulpit. Politics Overtake the Pulpit, that's a big one. And then we've got our notes for today. If you hear me turning pages, I actually have my notes are written down today in a notebook. Normally I have them typed out, but this one I scribbled on some notes on, and I thought this would be something that really, really um, can be a sign that the church is changing. And let me give it to you real quick, the title, and give you a little bit of information on what we're going to talk about within this series uh, moving forward. Uh, We've only got this part and then the next one, and that'll be 10 total signs we've covered that your church is changing, thereby ending the series. We will actually have our very next episode. We'll be discussing number 10, and I think it may be possibly the biggest reason churches change. You might say we save the best, which is actually the worst in this case. Uh, We save the worst for last. And I think this may be the biggest reason churches change, if we're not careful. And I think this can be a huge uh, contributing factor. So, but before we do that, let me encourage you, if you've enjoyed listening to Sandy Creek Stirrings and you've enjoyed this podcast, let me encourage you, share it with somebody else. You know a friend, you know somebody else in the family who could use listening to this podcast, who enjoys listening to podcasts, and you want to give them something biblical, um, I I truly feel, I truly feel that we have been able to maintain a very good biblical standard on this podcast. I never want to vary from biblical truth. 
And I feel like we've been able to accomplish that. And if you don't feel like that, you can always contact me and let me know. And uh, go to our website, sandycreekstirrings.com. Go to our contact page. You can find out how to contact me there. And uh, But share this podcast with somebody else. And you can also share it by going to our Facebook page. You can leave us a review there. Or you can share our post to your own personal Facebook feed. Um, but here we are. What is part number, well, number nine? Um, what is the ninth sign that your church may be changing. I'm going to give you the title, then I want to back up and kind of give a little commentary on the title. Number nine, I believe your church could be changing when the pastor becomes a monarch. I believe your church could be changing when your pastor becomes a monarch. Now, before you jump to conclusions on what this episode is about, let me give you just a little commentary on where we're going with this. I was honestly hesitant to record this as a reason the church is changing. You say, why? Because I believe there's enough uh, wrong criticism of pastors and church leadership going around, and I honestly did not want to be lumped in with that crowd. I feel, though, that anybody who listens to this episode in its entirety, they don't just look at the title and say, oh, here we go, another preacher basher, that's not what this is. I think anybody who listens to this episode will see where I'm coming from, will see the biblical truth there, and will acknowledge that, yes, this is true. Look, there are so many people, and there are so many podcasts, YouTube channels, Twitter pages that focus solely on bashing good preachers and good men of God. And they will say things that are untrue, they are unfounded, they've got some news article and they're like, oh, look at this, but the the truth be told that pastor has not been proven guilty, he's innocent until proven guilty. I mean, let's just be honest, there's some serious accusations going around that a lot of them just aren't true, and then we've got Christians in churches sitting around, well, that pastor so-and-so, you know, he did this. Let me ask you, have you ever talked to that pastor? Have you ever called him up and asked for his side of the story? You're just going to listen to whoever told you, well, he did this, you know, and he doesn't deserve to be a pastor, blah, blah, blah. Do your homework, do your research, call the pastor for yourself and say, hey, is this true? I think they'd be willing to talk to you about it. And say, I'm not, I'm not fishing for a news article, I'm not fishing for a podcast. I'm just a member who I've enjoyed listening to your preaching. I want to know if it's true. They'd be willing to answer your question. But let me tell you this: that there's enough pastor bashing going around. But I would be, is it the is the word remiss? I think it's remiss. I'd be remiss to not talk about the change of a pastor becoming a monarch, because I can tell you story after story after story again of churches that members got hurt, families got hurt, because a pastor didn't remain a pastor. Instead, he wanted to become a monarch. And I really tussled, I really struggled with producing this episode. And then I talked to my wife about it. And um, she told me, you know, you, you should pray about it a little bit more. And I finally decided that I would talk about it because the Bible talks about it. And I figure if the Bible talks about it, we should be willing to talk about it, right? You know, in 3 John, John mentions one of these pastors that fits along this idea of when a pastor becomes a monarch. He mentions him in 3 John, in fact, verse number 9. He mentions him. His name is Diotrephes. I think is how you pronounce it. Diotrephes. What a great name. And uh, John is writing, and in 3 John, he says in verse number 9, he says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Who loveth to what? Have the preeminence. The word preeminence literally means to be fond of, to be first. Diotrephes wanted to be first. He wanted the priority. He wanted to be favored. We continue in verse number 10 of that same book of 3 John. Now, of course, there's no chapters, just verses. But verse number 10 says, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Verse 11, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, 
Notice what John is calling Diotrephes. He says he's evil. Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. These are some pretty serious words by John. He's calling him evil. He says, you know, if he was a good pastor, he would be of God, but he's not. He hasn't even seen God. I mean, John's getting with it right here. And John um, is, is really calling out Diotrephes and what he's done there to this church. And he's talking about that. And what's the whole issue with Diotrephes is he loveth to have the preeminence. He loveth to be favored. He wants to be first. He wants to be the chief. He's a living example of 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, the end of verse 2. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Um, I once heard somebody say that this is, you know, verse, uh, verse number 1, the elders, it's talking about people who are older. That's not true. It's not talking about the older saints. It's talking about pastors. The word elder here is just another term for pastors. And when Peter's writing, he's saying, the pastors which are among you, I exhort. I, I, I want you to know this. And then he says verse 2. So he's writing to pastors. Very interesting enough. Verse number 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, um, is actually a message to pastors. And I think it applies to many different uh, situations and even within our own personal lives. But truth be told, Peter was writing this to the pastor, that he should be sober, be vigilant, because the adversary, the devil, he's walking around trying to eat people in your churches, trying to devour them. And that's why verse 9 says, "...whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world." But Diotrephes is a living example of verse number 2 of this passage, which says, "...feed the flock of God which is among you." taking the oversight thereof. Now, let me get into a little bit of what the pastor is, and I know we're already running uh, short on time, but we'll give you this list here exactly of what does a pastor do when he becomes a monarch. But one of the things the pastor is responsible for is in verse number two, feed the flock of God. That's giving them the Word of God. That's the preaching and teaching. Everything that happens behind that pulpit, the pastor will answer for. The pastor will answer for what he, who he allows to preach and teach within the church. And then it says, taking the oversight thereof. Notice a command of God through Peter is that a pastor should take the oversight of a church. You know, now that I'm talking about this, it'd be a really good idea for us to go over the qualifications and um, the duties of a pastor. We'll do that at some point. But he is to take the oversight thereof, meaning he is to oversee everything that happens within the local New Testament church. There's a lot of people who don't like that. There's a lot of people who don't like that. There's a, a podcast somebody produced the other day. I, I tuned in for a few minutes and then shut it down because it was just garbage. And um, But they were talking about, oh, pastors, you know, they need to have this this board and they need to make sure they have all this stuff, blah, 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 blah. No, the pastor is supposed to take oversight. He is to oversee everything. He's to oversee the finances. He's to oversee the, the preaching. He's to oversee the music ministry. He's to oversee everything, right? Taking oversight thereof. Now notice, here's the switch. That's good pastoring. Feeding the flock of God, taking the oversight thereof, good pastor. But notice what Peter does. He puts a dividing line. He says, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Peter says, hey, now we're not going to go and not, we're not going to handcuff the members to the chair and say, hey, you're going to listen to me or you're not going to leave here. No, he says, you need to take the oversight thereof and feed them willingly. Willingly. Then he says, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. And a pastor shouldn't be doing it for money. He should be doing it for a ready mind. Listen, this is very important Diotrephes, what was he doing in Third John? We said he was a living example of the end of verse 2. Diotrephes was taking oversight thereof by constraint. I mean, even John said himself, he, he would tell John, hey, you can't come here. And then he would notice what it says in verse number um, 10, who prating against us with malicious words and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church. No, you don't like it here? Get out of the church. You don't like it here? Get out. That is constraint. You're either going to take my way or the highway. And let me encourage you, there is a stand pastors need to make. 
There are some things they don't need to budge on. And yes, I think there are some times where it's appropriate to tell a member, hey, if you don't like it, this is biblical. This is the way we're going to go. Right? There are times for that. But Diotrephes wasn't doing it because he was ultra spiritual. He was doing it because he was evil. And so there are pastors in today, just like Diotrephes, who were like that. When I talked about Diotrephes, I realized, you know what? This needs to be discussed. It's good to verify that, though. It's good to verify that. You say, verify what? Verify that a pastor really is a Diotrephes and not a, and John would later go talk about somebody great by the name of Demetrius. Which is the pastor? Is he Diotrephes or is he Demetrius? Which in verse 12, hath the good report of all man. And the truth of itself, yea, and we also bear record, record, and you know that your, our record is true. Is he Diotrephes or is Demetrius? You need to verify that for yourself. I would be very careful about listening to a disgruntled former member and saying, oh, he must be telling the truth. Don't just take his word for it. Verify it for yourself. Let me tell you something. Sometimes a member will get something stuck in his crawl, and um, is that even a proper term to use? I don't know. Sometimes he'll get something stuck in his crawl, and he'll say, well, our pastor, he's harsh. He's arrogant. He's a monarch. He's power-loving. He's dictatorial. He's a heavy shepherd. Yet the fault may be the members and not the pastors. The fault may be the members and not the pastors. They may not have liked something he did, something the way he handled something, something he said. They may disagree with something that's so, oh, here's another Christian term that some people don't like to use, something so stupid. What is the deal? And you're like, what? why are you having a problem with that? But they get disgruntled, and now they want to discredit him. Remember, remember there is always someone who thinks they can do it better. Oh, why? I don't think he handled that the right way. If I were the pastor. Yeah, if you're the pastor, at the first sign of trouble, you would run. Because that's what you did. Right? Right? You're disgruntled. I'm leaving this church at the first sign of trouble you ran. And you know how much trouble a pastor faces on a daily basis? Yeah, we really need to do an episode on uh, the duties of a pastor and open up some minds. But remember this. Before pointing the finger at a pastor and saying, he's a monarch, do an examination of the source first, then yourself, and then the pastor. Doing that in that order can maybe solve the problem before you even get to the pastor. Because many times you get somebody who's just frustrated, they are disgruntled, and they want to discredit the pastor. That's never a good thing. Always verify whether he's a Diotrephes or Demetrius first. All right, here we go. Here's the actual list for today. We won't spend much time on this. How can we tell when a pastor begins to become a monarch? Number one, he becomes more focused on personal gain than ministry growth. He becomes more focused on personal gain than ministry growth. Hey, you know, I, I really think, you know, y'all should take care of my need. I have this big problem, and, you know, I think y'all should handle it. Look, there are times for the pastor to honestly come to the church when he's struggling with something, and maybe he needs some help. There are times for that. I think a good church will help their pastor before that ever happens. And I'll be honest with you. I don't know a truly amazing and great pastor that goes to his people and says, hey, I have this problem, I need your help. He prays and he asks God, and God handles it. Now, I think it's perfectly fine. I would not personally, this is me, this is my personal opinion, I wouldn't have a problem if a pastor, and I'm not just, my pastor is my father, so you might say that's a little different. Let's move me to a different church. Move me to a different church, and you've got a pastor there that I respect and looked up to. Otherwise, he would not be my pastor. But I respect and I looked up to him, and I love him and his family. If he came to me and said, I need help, I would not be offended by that personally. Personally. Now, I would do some investigation, make sure this is not a standard by which he lives by, but it wouldn't. I would want to help my pastor. And a good church takes care of their pastor before it ever gets to that point. And I, yeah, so that's all I'm going to say on that topic. If you've got more questions, you can email me. Number two, he begins to care more about being served than being a servant. He cares more about being served than being a servant. Let me put this little example in there real quick. I love what my pastor does. Every single time we have a church fellowship, something special going on. There is food on the table, and we're all going through the line. Here's what he does. He waits till the end. And, oh boy, the people don't like it. And every now and then they'll get him, and they'll just kind of shove him up. You know, that sounds bad. But they'll kind of get him up to the front, you know, make him go. 
But if he has if he has his wishes, then he stays at the back of the line, and people say, "Preacher, you you need to go first. No, and here's how he responds: I am the servant of the church first. I'm the servant of the church first, and that's really the role of a pastor is to serve the church. He is a servant of the Lord. And that's so big. When we have a transition from a pastor who has been a servant, a servant at heart, to where suddenly he chooses he would rather be served, then we might have a pastor who's becoming a monarch. Number three, he becomes more of a cattle driver than an under-shepherd. Right? There's a difference between a cattle driver, right? A cattle driver, what do they do? They get behind the cows and they push them. And there, by the way, there are times for that. But then you've got a shepherd. What does a shepherd do? Historically, a shepherd gets out front and leads the sheep, calling them by name. Sometimes we can have a pastor who, rather than unify and motivate the people for biblical things, chooses to drive them to personal destinations. Chooses to drive them. Instead of leading them and leading them by example, we want to drive them. Oh, you know what? You and, I, and they get on these things, and oh, you know, you, but they, the pastor's not willing to do it himself. That's not leading, that's driving. And sometimes we, we can get hard-spirited. We can get harsh. Sometimes we can turn around, come out from in front of the sheep we're leading and start to push them and drive them. That's in it. You know, there are times for that where you got to get behind a sheep and push them. Say, hey, yeah, we need to do this. But it's important that, first of all, we be a shepherd and we lead them. There's a difference between saying, you better be at church or I'm going to call you and I'm going to come to your door and I'll make sure you're at church. That would be a cattle driver. Or the pastor who says, you know, let me show you from the Bible why God says you should be at church every single time the doors are open and takes them through the God's Word. That's a shepherd. There's a difference. Number four, he becomes willing to handle, or he becomes unwilling to handle issues within the church. The monarch, when things happened in the kingdom, he had all the elected officers and different people who, if something happened, well, that's your, your, your territory, you need to handle that. And sometimes a pastor, if he's not careful, can become unwilling to handle issues within the church. There is false doctrine maybe being spread. Maybe somebody's sharing a preacher to other church members who is just a heretic. And sometimes the pastor's like, eh, eh, you know, if they don't if they don't know he's a heretic, they're not going to realize it because, you know, we teach the Word of God here, blah, blah, blah. And they're not willing to handle it. The reason why is they're not willing to deal with the confrontation. The confrontation can sometimes scare. And trust me, I'm not a confrontational guy. I hate confrontation. But sometimes the confrontation can scare us from being willing to handle issues. And to do is what First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, warns the pastors to do, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And so a pastor, when he becomes unavailable to handle issues, there's an issue in the church, we know it's been brought to the pastor, and the pastor just will not handle it. Like, it's, it's, it's clear. The evidence is there. He's not willing to handle it. I'm not talking about something where, hey, you know, this needs to be handled, and the pastor handles it in a way behind the scenes that maybe you don't realize about. But maybe going to the pastor and saying, hey, there's this issue, and he says, you know, I'm not going to worry about that. That is a pastor who is unwilling to handle issues within the church. By the way, before you think, oh, that's a big deal, oh my goodness, you're right, that's happening, make sure the issue is an actual issue, not a personal soapbox. Because sometimes things that are a big issue with us aren't really that big of a deal, but because they matter to me, well, that's an issue. Well, I would make sure it's a biblical doctrinal issue first, and uh, and then take it to the pastor, not a personal soapbox. Number five, um, a pastor becomes a monarch is one who becomes unavailable to the people. He becomes unavailable to the people. He used to visit his members, now he doesn't anymore. He used to have members over to his house, now he doesn't anymore. He's done preaching, he puts on his coat, shakes a hand, one, two, walks out the door and leaves. Uh, Shows up late to church, doesn't fellowship anymore, stops going to different activities and things. That could be a sign that the pastor may be becoming a monarch. And then number six, and this is the last one, he changes his focus from spiritual growth to attendance. Spiritual growth to attendance. By the way, both are important. 
right? Because growth of a church can be measured both spiritually and numerically. And you say, well, uh, it's not all about numbers. Really? Then why did God count how many people they fed with the fish and the, and the bread? Why did God count all the people that were saved and baptized on the day of Pentecost? Why did God have, and I could take you over and 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 over again, where God made sure to give you the numbers. So both are important. Numerical growth is important, and spiritual growth is important. They are both vital. But you don't have to sacrifice one for the other. Sometimes a pastor can lose his focus and become this monarch in the way that we're going to focus on making sure the numbers, and that's when changes like dimming the lights, introducing CCM, casualizing of the dress standards, all those different things happen because he's more interested in numerical growth than spiritual growth. Can I just tell you this? Spiritual growth will lead to numerical growth. Because when you get people who are spiritually mature and spiritually growing, what's their desire? They want other people to grow too. God's been working on their heart about soul winning, so they're inviting other people. God's been working on their heart about living a a right life with God. And now they're impacting their spouse who doesn't go to church or their children who who don't go to church. right? So spiritual growth can lead to numerical growth, but you don't have to sacrifice one for the other. And sometimes, if we're not careful, a pastor who becomes a monarch can trade spiritual growth and solid biblical preaching for numerical growth. And they have to start preaching on, you know, uh, the Hollywood movie series, you know, we're going to preach on, you know, based on Hollywood movies and all that, and that's legitimate things that happens in churches across America. They sacrifice spiritual growth for the numbers. Both are important. You don't have to sacrifice either one for the sake of the other. Both really work hand in hand. So when the pastor becomes a monarch, I believe is a sign that your church may be changing. Can I just remind you again, verify that for yourself. Don't take somebody else's word for it. Don't go around bashing another church because, well, so-and-so down there said this happened. Check it out for yourself. Uh, make sure that is true, and make sure that is um, something that's verifiable. There are facts, and I would check that out first. Then check yourself, check your spirit, because maybe you have something at kind of the, leaning that way against that that pastor in some fashion. Check it, check your heart first, and then check the facts. Check the source. Check yourself. Then check the facts. And when the pastor becomes a monarch, may be a sign your church is changing. Now, the very next episode is going to be, I believe, the number one reason why churches change across America. The number one reason you'll want to tune in for that episode number whatever episode we're on. I think it may be 209 will be the next episode. But until next time, my friends, hey, keep looking up and keep stirred up for the cause of Christ.